We thought you'd kill us off. I tried. We're back. I'm mad as hell. You want to have a great shootout of 2010? Yeah. Fine. Let's do it. Five paces. One, two, three, four, five. Wow, uh, we got some great stuff for you in episode three. But I want to just uh, talk a little bit. I know we've talked about this in episode one, episode two, and now we're going to say it in three because I don't know if everybody's seen this. So let's talk a little bit about this unbiased test. Yeah. What do you think about that? Well, uh, the first thing is that we kind of removed ourselves from it and had uh, these, you know, bigwigs in the industry, if you want to call them that, yeah. uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, administer the test. We decided to get Robert Primes and Gary Adcock and Philip Bloom uh, and, Ryan Emerson. and Ryan Emerson from Radar, uh, John Truckenbroad and uh, Grant Cheney and Matt Harger, colorist as well. These guys are not interested in selling any of our gear or have anything to do with promotion. They want to do this test and they're going to do it the way they want. Right. And, and we told them to do it the way they want. We also want to acknowledge our sponsors, uh, Resolution Digital Studios, uh, for all the stages and projection, Astro Film Workers for processing and all of the color timing, Radar Studios, Green Screen, the Landmark Century City Theater and the Midwest Film Festival, especially Mike McNamara for uh, putting together this screening for us. Of course, my friend Reed Brody at Film Workers Astro for supplying us with uh, film processing and the color timing suite for most of the color timing work we did and James at Schumacher Camera for all the film cameras. This is the final episode. This is where it all comes together and we kind of figure out why we've been looking at all these different components of the video and I think you're really going to get the it's all going to come together at the end of this episode. And the first thing we're going to take a look at is the resolution test. We did that in the bathroom scene where we did the latitude test, but here we blew up a section of that. We refocused on that magazine in the background and, and blew that up so that uh, you can kind of see in the type of the magazine uh, which cameras can hold up and, and what their uh, resolutions are. We did that both in 2K and 4K. Okay, let's check it out. So the first test we're going to see today is a resolution test. Our order of presentation will be the Kodak at 2K and 4K, the Fuji at 2K and 4K, the 5D Mark II, the 7D, the 1D Mark IV, the D3S, and the GH1. And this is an extreme blow up to about 350%, depending on the camera. And we also scan the film at 2K and 4K, and you'll see this in seven second durations. We're going to be looking specifically at the text in the magazine, the Pure. I mean, you'll see sometimes it's going to be sharp and sometimes it's going to have less resolution. Yeah, there's a big difference between the 2K and 4K. Uh, another thing to look at is the detail in the fans coming out of the vase. Um, yeah, there's like little, there's a little pattern up in the tip of that and you'll see that pattern is either so sharp or it can get a little defocused depending on which camera. And what about the bubble? Um, as, the, as the bubble crosses the screen, take a look at the trail it leaves behind on some of the DSLRs. The compression leaves some interesting artifacts. All right, let's show the test. Here we go, Kodak, 2K resolution. Take a look at uh, the word pure. And the fans, look at the detail in the pattern of the fans. When it switches to, now it's in 4K. Now look at the- Fuji in 2K. Yeah, this is the Fuji. Look at, look at the resolution in the fan and the pure. And then at 4K. Quite a bit of difference, what do you think? Now with the digital cameras, look at the color aberration too in the detail. Uh, you can see that in the very center of the frame in the words. Obviously, video cameras were never meant to blow up like this. Here's the 7D. These, uh, the DSLRs are being blown up at 352%. That's a big blow up for video. Right. Here's the D3S.
and the GH1. GH1. I was taken by the, how much grain there was. When you have the lack of grain, all of a sudden you start seeing this moving texture, and we're so used to seeing it as a pattern in the imagers, that's always been a wrong thing, that we actually forget there's something organic and friendly about grain in the film images. And now the sensors have gotten to the point where we're getting such clean imagery, how do we look at this in a way that gives us the same kind of feel that grain does? And there's the codec at 4K. Notice how the type sharpens up? It's a good reason why film should be scored at 4K. There was a noticeable sharpness difference between the 2K and the 4K scans, and a noticeable sharpness difference between Kodak and Fuji at 4K. On the internet, you're not going to be able to see, you know, difference of 2K and 4K, but if you blow it up, you can see the resolution. We could see it in the, in the viewing suite when we were testing all of this, that there was a difference between a 4K Kodak scan and a 4K Fuji scan. And that was a real eye-opener for some of us. Film is far superior to DSLRs in this case. But Film is still a, the, the kind of uh, reference. It's the stalwart w on which you gauge uh, images against. If we didn't label them, would you have known? Yeah, yeah, you can definitely see some resolution difference in that. It's hard to completely compare to film. You notice the Nikon compression too, particularly on a 30-foot screen. It's one thing to see things on the internet. It's one thing to see things on your computer screen. And it just blew my mind actually seeing on the theater like that with the big screen. It's amazing, yeah. That's where you really get a sense of the capabilities and the kind of shortcomings. Okay, so now we move on to this color test. Some of the feedback we were getting at, at even a couple of the screenings was that, uh, oh yeah, this, this all looks great and all that, but I didn't see a whole lot of color in there. I would like to have seen some color. So why not? We were already going to add some tests to it, so the color test was a, a simple thing to do. We set up yeah. that bouquet of flowers, had a model in there for the skin tone, and um, now people can see you know, how vibrant these cameras can look. All right, let's check it out. Let's take a look at the color test. Here we basically shot all the different cameras in a very colorful environment. So all the DSLR cameras were rated at ISO 160, and the Kodak and Fuji were both rated at 200. And you're going to look at these in seven second durations. Man, look at those, uh, uh, the green leaves in the upper left. That is a, and the face. And the, the color of the flowers. It's the 5D Mark II. The 7D. Look at the green leaves on the 7D. Very similar to the film. The 1D Mark IV. Here's the T2i. It's very similar to the 70. Yep. The D3S. People need to know this is a 720p camera. And the GH1. Okay, here's the same test now, but much quicker with three second duration so you can really get a feel for how they feel next to each other. First we have the Kodak and the Fuji. 5D, 7D, 1D Mark IV, T2i, T3S, and the GH1. It was impressive. Yeah. 5D looks like known. film. Yeah, the, yeah, the skin tones on the 5D are just as good or better than film. It looked like there was a little more in the red flower. It looked like there was a little more resolution and a little more, uh, the colors were more appealing to my eye at least. But it looked great. I thought the skin tones looked wonderful on <coughs> 5D, 7D. I mean, what do you feel about the actual ability to grade this material? It was a struggle yesterday to, to just stretch the image out and get some detail in the shadows. Um, it definitely is not the same. It feels different when you work with it. Trying to match all these is not easy, no. The Kodak and the Fuji, I could play with all day and do so many different things. Like, you know, if we wanted to, we could make them look exactly like each other. I think they yeah. pair beautifully together. You could clearly cut between these and film in a lot of, in a lot of situations. And that's a, that's a big leap of faith for a lot of people. You don't have to choose one or the other, you know, the and, and the way I take these things apart is the 5D is your Airy Cam or your Panavision Platinum. 
Then your 7D is like your 435 utility camera, you know, crane camera with PL mounts and all that kind of stuff. And you know, you, you, that's kind of your, your recipe. So now we're gonna take a look at examples that really pertain to this episode. And we wanna show work from three different uh, director producers. The first one we're gonna see is called The Last Three Minutes from Shane Hurlbut. Here it is. Yeah, I mean, come on right now. You can meet us. No, it's Chateau. Yeah, I can't wait. Why? <laughs> you mean last time? <laughs> no way. Okay, so now we move on to this green screen test. Right, uh, that was a late entry. Uh, yeah, you know, there's been talk around. People are like, oh yeah, these cameras they look nice right out of the right out of the box, but the minute you got to start keying or anything like that, they're probably going to fall apart. I want to see that. You know, mm -hmm. all these people are saying that it's going to, you know, the, the compression and all this are going to make them horrible. I want to see it. So we decided to do this green screen test, and you'll see 
uh, we're going to key it against these gray backgrounds because I wanted to see more of this zipper effect. Right. I think that that's going to be very interesting for people. Let's check it out. So now we're going to do our green screen test. Give me the specifics, Dan. Uh, it's a basic key with a model against a green screen, and we did our post work at Radar Studios with a flame system. So this is the codec. Yep. Take a look at the motion in her hair when she moves her hair. And the Fuji. It's the 5D Mark II. The 7D. The 1D Mark IV. Here's the T2I. D3S. And the GH1. Okay, here's the same test now, but much quicker with three second duration so you can really get a feel for how they feel next to each other. So first we have the Kodak and the Fuji. 5D, 7D, 1D Mark IV, T2I, D3S, and the GH1. How did you just feel like the green screen looked? Was it usable? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It works. Really well. Like Steve kind of said, I'd heard over and over people saying because of the compression uh, and the bad artifacting and uh, subsampling that you would not be able to get a clean key. Pulling these keys um, of this girl on film was perfect. I mean, we saw problems and different, you know, issues that could arise in each different camera. I think in the hair, for sure, we saw like when she had her hair flowing. That was where we could see the the biggest difference was in the alpha channel. That's where you really saw which ones were really holding up versus the uh, ones that had more artifacts. The 70 was good. It was That was, I think, the surprise for us. We actually found that it keyed maybe the best out of all of them in the sense of softness and everything. Maybe it did have too much softness, but it really helped the key. We saw single strands of hair moving around, and uh, it, I, I got to say it performed admirably. One of the biggest areas were her jeans. There was definitely a difference between the way her pants were recorded. It was that pre-processing that there were some instances where her pants were more magenta. The blue actually just kind of disappeared with the green when we pulled it in the darker values. Certainly some of them had more blockiness than others. The D3S was uh, definitely the dirtiest out of all the cameras. Um, instantly when we pulled it, you could look at the Mac channel and it was really huge rectangular you know, artifacts. It's almost even more important to shoot good green screen. Most of the same rules are going to apply um, because if these things aren't followed and the camera is already a, possibly a little bit inferior, certainly to film, um, it's going to make pulling mats really challenging. You could probably get a decent key out of most of these cameras, but some of them would be much faster than others for sure. Am I open to work with it? Absolutely. We should change the gears and talk about the workflow a little bit. It's important that people realize that we really did want to go out of our way to find the best possible workflow for everyone to have. It's a completely different work of uh, way of work. Oh my God. Is this what I think it is? Holy shit. This is the ProRes. Flip those back and forth, Ryan. It's all about the codec with these cameras. It's definitely one of the, the biggest things we've learned from this. My workflow was really bad because I used the original video from the uh, compact flash card and I put into the computer and I work with this, this video in H264 mm -hmm. without any kind of uh, compression, recompression. The digital formats had gone in and out of uh, what uh, exactly? H.264, I think, to ProRes. You probably saved yourself going through ProRes. Because any time you took an H.264, which is an RGB file, in a Rec. 601 color space, 
on open it up on a high-end system directly to DPX, directly to uncompressed, directly to any legacy format, it bit us in the rear every single time. When we tried to do the EXR, it was a little, maybe too much information. It instantly blew up into the Gamma book. If you're gonna have a camera that's this new and technology that's this advanced, you better have a workflow that's just as new as the camera you're working on. Take your, your native format and, and convert it into a, a high quality format to edit with and color with. Anytime we took this through a modern codec, we went RGB from the cameras, the Canon cameras specifically, we went RGB into um, ProRes into Cineform, into anything that was a modern codec, we had no issues with the Mac Gamma book. It does make a huge difference. You kind of think that, well, it's recorded this, you know, just by turning it into something else, it's, it, how can it be any better? But we've, we've definitely proven that by converting it into a higher end format makes the world of difference. The next piece we're going to see is from Eddie Schneider in Romania and he is the producer on this piece and the reason we picked it is because also filled with tons of green screen I think you're really going to enjoy this check this out All right, so this is the interesting one, Jens. The last test, which we're calling the pseudo-raw test. What this is is sort of the peak into the future. What could we expect to see if these cameras could go raw? This is the glimpse here, yeah. So it's gonna be really interesting. Check this out. Okay, here is what we're gonna call our pseudo-raw test. And we sort of decided to do this to kind of just give people an idea of what raw might look like when it happens. So this is the 5D H.264 video. The video has 10 stops, you can see. And the scopes. And here's the 5D RAW. 
look how much more latitude you get, especially in the low end. So here, here you can see it switching back and forth, and what you really notice is, is that you have, you have a lot more shadow detail. You're picking up about two and a half stops. So that puts this, the rod about 12 and a half stops. And you could even push that a bit more. I bet you could get 13 stops out of that rod. So this is a real world example of the difference in latitude between H.264 and pseudo raw. These are the spot readings. Behind her head here is an F16. The highlighted area on the couch here is F.7. The highlighted point on her face is an F2.84 split. So here is the 5D H.264 still frame. And here is the 5D raw still frame. Now here, just to make it a little easier, we're gonna switch back and forth. The things to look at are the hot spot behind her head, and then also look at the, uh, the grill underneath the television, and also the detail in the side of her head, in her hair, and in the couch. Of course, the DSLR can never catch up to like 35 millimeter unless they shoot rod. I would hope and assume that eventually it's going to get there. If they get that raw thing out, mm. we, can, we can really fly with them. Yeah. If that sensor can go raw and still stay the same size, that will be revolutionary. What the sensor is capable of and what the output is is a huge gap. I think the more, informa the more information I have, uh, the better it is. That's, that's really what it comes down to. What you see is, what I really take notice to is, yes, the, the, you can see the crack in the background and all that, but, but what's very noticeable for me is the brown couch. And you can see the 8-bit to 14-bit uh, color shift huge. There's a lot of difference between 8-bit and 14-bit. <laughs> you can kind of say, okay, if 8-bit compressed color gives you two shades of brown, 10-bit will give you four, 12-bit will give you eight, 14-bit will give you 16. And you're seeing that in this pseudo workflow, you're seeing the gradations and the color and the different shades of that leather uh, chair. The potential, thinking a few years down the line, of, this, of these chips is 21 megapixels, which is more like IMAX, which is higher resolution than film. Then we're, then we're going to start handling these images like you do any D-Bear, like SI2K, like Airy Raw, like Red. Probably closer than we those. think. So we are potentially looking at something that with the right engineering and developments and all that could absolutely exceed 35 millimeter uh, film and almost everything. Once you've got Raw, it is... Yeah. Even for a release uh, print, the if there weren't the enough viewing, digital but, theaters, you, know, you could take that footage and do a release print for it, and it would stand up to anything else that's out there. What does that mean for film? Well, I mean, it's over. <laughs> we are not talking about video anymore. We are talking about film, a digital film. This is the first yes. time that really there are no boundaries between video and film. Carlos Loscano, who it was so great to come from Madrid to be at the screening. What, the reason why we really want to show his piece is because this was shot with a 7D and all of it is done in, in green screen. Not only that, but there's a lot of stills, of course, right? So you have that uh, bigger resolution. No, yeah, oh, absolutely, Jens. This thing is actually a mixture of RAW and H.264 and green, green screen, screen right. which is what we're talking about in this whole episode. Mm -hmm. So let's check this out. This is really an incredible piece here. J'ai pas le temps de te dire que tu es belle J'ai bien mieux à faire Je dois classer tous mes emails J'ai pas le temps de t'emmener au bord de la mer Sur les sites de vente aux enchères, c'est peut-être qu'une idée, c'est peut-être par peur d'être démodé, mais j'ai pas le temps. Les yeux grillés devant l'écran, j'ai pas, j'ai pas, j'ai pas le temps. Les galipettes, les galipettes 
Jens, we saw a lot of different tests. It's important, and I think people are going to ask us, why didn't we include the red? Why didn't we include an EX3? You know, the, At first we thought about doing that. We did, but it's so hard to do an apples-to-apples -apples test. And it's a lot to take in when you're viewing it, too. If you have so many of these cameras, I mean, by the time you get to the last one, you've forgotten what the first one looks like. Really right. hard to digest all that. But I really learned a lot just from our own tests. And even every time I watch it, I kind of pick up something new that uh, that's interesting to me. So I hope that benefited everybody by seeing our test. Right. All right, well, um, this was great. Um, I think that we learned a lot, and uh, we thank everybody for watching our test. Mm -hmm. Take it Enjoy. easy.